morning, church. Oh, hello. Good morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? Well, thank you for joining us for week one of our new series you saw on the screen, Unveiled Kingdom. But also, um, Happy New Year. You know, last year, our first Sunday of the year fell on January 1st. So understandably, some of you had been up till like 2 a.m., and didn't come to church. That was okay. We had one of our elders actually showed up. She's like, I was up till 3 a.m. I'm like, and you're here? My goodness. My wife and I, we are exciting on New Year's. We go to bed at 9.30. So, yeah. Yeah, we used to get a, stay up late, but no, not anymore. Anyways, um, we're getting started this year, though. Uh, and, and we have a, we believe that one of the most important things when it comes to a new year is not merely what we think we should be doing, what we feel our lives should, the direction our lives should go, or, or, or how we feel about a situation, but we believe that one of the most important things for us to do is to be focused on Jesus. Where is God calling us? What is God calling us to do in this year? You know, we just flipped calendar six days ago from 2023 to 2024, and I know for some of us, that is a big deal. For others, not so much. For me, I just have to remember now to put a four at the end of the date instead of a three. It'll take me a year to get it right, and next year will be the same problem. But, you know, the beauty of a new year, even though it's, it's kind of the same thing, it's just Dates are changing. If we didn't have a calendar, who cares? Nobody would know there's a difference. But I love the new year in this idea that it represents something new. It represents a new start. It represents this opportunity to start again that diet you promised you'd do last year, and you didn't. Or that opportunity, again, to reconnect with that, that long-lost family member that you've been missing and praying for and, and just haven't been able to reconcile with. It represents these opportunities for new. It's almost like 2023, now that that's gone, that is the old. And we all have this opportunity to step into the next thing, into the new thing that God is calling us to. And so, as a church, we love this idea. We love this concept because I believe God is always calling us deeper. God is always calling us to something new. God is always doing something in our lives. And if we stay stagnant in one place, we will miss the next thing. Now, too often, we as Christians, we get stuck listening to the last word God gave us. And we're like, God, why aren't you speaking? Because he's moved on. Where is he leading you next? What he did in the past is amazing, but what is he doing now? So as we start this year, I want to start with this question of, God, what is next? You know, when I was back in high school, I had a youth pastor who, at the time, he went, on, he went to this like, youth leadership training conference, something like that down in California. And when he came back, he brought back these posters with Romans 8, verse 15, 14 and 15 on them. And I know, many of us probably know that verse, but the way that this poster phrased it, it was in the message translation, just something about it hit me. No, in the, in the NRSVUE, this is my favorite translation because it's just a, a great translation for biblical study. Um, it, says, it says this, Romans 8, verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I love this verse in, in the NRSV because it, it just emphasizes you are God's child. God's spirit dwells in you. As a believer in Christ, Ephesians 1 says that you are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. His spirit lives in you and his spirit testifies you are God's child. 1 John 5 says the spirit is true. It is not false. 
And I love this idea that we can cry, Abba, Father. You know, that phrase is used three times in the Bible. Once by Jesus, once by the Holy Spirit, and once as a statement right here of what we get to do. But the, 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 the way that this verse was phrased, though, in, in the message, it, something about it just hit me. And I won't speak to whether the message's translation is good or not. The message is a translation. It's known as a thought-for-thought translation. So it's more of a a, a less literal translation than like the NRSV. But anyways, if we could throw it up in the message. It says, God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It is adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? I meant to bring the poster this morning, I forgot. But I love that phrasing. Life is adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? And for me, I don't know if maybe that verse hits me more because growing up, I called my dad Papa. He was Belgian. It's a bit more of a European thing than we see normally in Canadian culture, but that, that's just what I grew up calling him. But I love this idea that we have this invitation from God to cry out, be like, God, what is next? And so as we get started in this year, as we meet for the first time in 2024, this is the challenge I want to put to you. That we would be a church, that we would be a people that would ask God this year, what do you have next for me? What's next? What do you have for me in 2024? Now in Isaiah 48, we find an interesting passage of scripture that it kind of gives this massive overview of the history of Israel. And to sum up kind of the start of this verse, essentially, it, it, it talks about how God chose thousands of years before this verse was written, God chose a man named Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I will, if you serve me, I will bless you. I will give you children, even though you're in your 90s. You'll, you'll be blessed. Your children will be blessed. And through you, I will bless the world. And I love that wording because in Galatians 3, it refers to this verse from Genesis 12 where where it says that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. That through Jesus, all people are blessed. But from Abraham's line, God raised up a nation. Abraham had his son Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had a bunch of kids who then grew out into the tribes that we know as the tribes of of Israel. These 12 tribes that made up this nation. And this nation, the nation of Israel, was one selected by God to be his ambassadors. See, Exodus chapter 19 puts it this way. It says, God, this is God speaking through Moses to, to the people. Moses was the leader of the Israelites at the time. It says, now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Now, I love this passage because the idea of a priestly kingdom means a kingdom that represents God to others. We'll dig into this more next week, I promise. Um, But for the sake of time and not wanting to keep you past lunch, we, we won't go too deep here. But Priestly kingdom is this idea that the priests mediated access to the God. So the priests allowed people to enter into the presence of the God. The priests showed their God to the people, and Israel was called to be this priestly kingdom. And through Moses, God leads Israel out of captivity in Egypt, as Erica mentioned earlier. Through Joshua, the next leader, he leads them into this promised land, a nation that is theirs to have forever. But then, the next couple hundred years of Israelite history, they play almost this game of chicken with God. It's like, God will serve you! Because right now, it seems like the best option. 
Oh, no, we're going to do our own thing. Okay, God, we'll serve you. And just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until finally they're conquered. God allows the nations of Babylon and Assyria to come in and conquer Israel, and they're carried off into captivity. So this is the context that we find in Isaiah 48. In Isaiah 48, verse 17, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking to the nation of Israel and revealing God's plans and purposes to them. It says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you how to succeed, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your prosperity would have been like a river and your success like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. Go out from Babylon. Flee from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy. Proclaim it. Send it forth to the ends of the earth. Say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Love that. The Lord is the one who teaches us to succeed, who leads us in the way to go. But this passage is speaking this idea that God is saying to Israel, if you hadn't abandoned me, your nation, your children, your families would be in prosperity. Things would be going so well for me, for you, but you abandoned me. And so I let you be carried off. And now Israel is in this hopeless place. They're in captivity. Everything they had is lost. But I love that last line. The Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. This idea that we see scattered throughout Scripture, that it does not matter how much you do, how much you hate God, how much you sin against God, how much you abandon God and reject God. It does not matter what you do. God, his love for you is unconditional. And God, even though Israel abandoned him time and time and time again, God says, I still love you. I will still show you grace. I will still restore you and I will still redeem you. That means not just, oh, I love you, but you're in prison. Oh no, that sucks. That means I'm going to let you out. Everything that you lost will come back. I love that. That is the God we serve. But I want to focus on that first verse. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you how to succeed, who leads you in the way you should go. I love this imagery. God is the one who teaches us and who leads us. You know, in the Hebrew, the word that is used for teach, I believe, if we can throw up the next slide, I believe it's lama, lamad. Yes, lamad. Might be butchering the pronunciation. I have no idea. I know how to look up Hebrew words. I do not know what they mean or, or, or how to say them. I just, I just find them in a dictionary. But the word for teach in this passage that we translate as teach is the Hebrew word lamad, which means to teach through active exercise. So the imagery is kind of like if you're a parent and you have a young kid who's just learning to walk. When your kid is like just starting to push themselves up and trying to take their first steps, you're not over in the kitchen looking at them in the living room being like, come on, you can do it. Oh, you fell on your face, you dirty, rotten kid. You're there. You're alongside them. You're holding them up. You're helping them. It's this active participation and teaching. Or, or to tie it into something maybe some of us remember better, it's like when you're in school and learning math. I mean, some teachers would be on the board, 2 plus 2 equals 2, and if you didn't get it, good luck. I had a few of those teachers. But then some teachers, as soon as they realize, oh, you're not getting it, they'll come alongside. Be like, two plus two equals four. Do you know why? Count your fingers. One, two, three, four. It's this idea of a good parent, a good teacher, walking alongside, actively teaching and helping. 
And this is the imagery that God is portraying himself with, that he is the teacher. He is the one walking alongside. He is the one teaching us with active exercises to help us along. Specifically, it says, to teach you how to succeed. In the Hebrew language, in their culture, that would have been understood as to teach you how to be blessed. God is our teacher. And then the second word, lead. It's the Hebrew word derek, which literally means to, to lead, to direct one's steps. It's like if you have a dog on a leash, you lead them where you want them to go, as, assuming they're properly leash trained. Otherwise, they try to lead you where they want to go. But this is the imagery. God is there. He's teaching us actively. He's walking alongside us. He's helping us go in the right direction. And to ancient Israel, this was a profound statement. This, I mean, it's echoed throughout Scripture, but it's a profound reminder of who God wanted to be for the people of Israel. That God wanted to walk alongside them. God wanted to lead them. God wanted to teach them what was right and what was wrong. God wanted to be their father. It's this imagery that invokes intimacy, relationship. That God wants to be with us. And specifically, this promise is made to the Israelite people, but we see through the New Testament that the same promise is made to us, that God wants to be our teacher and our leader. See, in Matthew chapter 23, we find this fun passage of scripture, if you've ever read Matthew 23, you know this as Jesus's tirade against the Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders of the day. I believe it's like five or six times Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he keeps describing them as people who have spiritual authority, but are abusing it for their own gain. And Jesus is saying to his disciples in the crowd, don't be like them. But then he says this, this passage, or this, this, this profound statement, verse 8. He says, you are not to call, be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. Rabbi in the Hebrew is the word for teacher. And you are all brothers and sisters. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. And then Jesus goes on to, to highlight to the crowd that influence and importance in the kingdom of God is not about status, but about service. And that is the point Jesus is making through this passage. But I love this subtext that we see here. But Jesus is saying, hey, it's not about titles. It's not about status. It's about service. Will you serve? Will you put others first? But underneath, notice what he's saying. You have one teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. You have one father, the one in heaven. You have one instructor, the Messiah. Jesus is reminding the people, I am your teacher. Like, Jesus is your teacher. God is your father. Jesus is your instructor. And no, the point here is not to say, oh, I can't honor my teacher by calling them a teacher at school. I have to just call them by their first name. Or, oh, I can't call my dad, dad. That's not the point. The point is don't seek to elevate yourself above others through status. But the subtext we see is that God is our teacher. God is our father. God is the one who will instruct us. God is the one who will help us. But the question is, will you let him? See, God is our father. He wants to teach us. He wants to lead us. He wants to discipline us, which is this, not this idea of punishment. It's this idea of training in righteousness. He wants to help us. He wants to walk alongside us. But we have the choice to either let him or not. 
See, one of the things I firmly believe about God that we see throughout Scripture is this idea that God is a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. You have to let him in. It's this idea we we see coming from Revelation 3, verse 20. The context of this verse is is that Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea and and John is writing down the words Jesus is saying. And the church in Laodicea, this was a city in modern day Turkey, and, and, and this church was known as being lukewarm. They had served God, they had been on fire for God, they loved God, but they had come to this place of complacency where now they kind of are like, ah, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but whatever. And they're relying on their money rather than relying on God. And into this context, Jesus says to them, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you, and you with me. Now notice, a lot of times Christians, we use this to talk about salvation. But notice, the context is, this is being written to people who already believe in Jesus. People who have kind of just wandered away. They've become complacent. Now they're stepping back and they're just relying on themselves. And Jesus is saying, I'm at the door. I'm knocking. Will you let me in? It's kind of like if you order a package online and it's being shipped with like UPS or FedEx or one of those companies and it requires a signature. They're going to show up to your door and knock on your door. You might be home, but if you don't open that door, you're never getting the package. It's this invitation that we have to engage with God, to ask God for guidance, to ask God for wisdom, to let God speak into our life. But we have to let him. God is a gentleman. He won't force himself on you. That's why in Genesis 1, he put two trees in the garden. He told Adam and Eve, don't eat from that one. But he gave them free will. He let them do it. That's why, and I believe it's in 1 Samuel, King David is on his rooftop, and he looks out, and he sees a a girl bathing. And he's like, I want her. And then he goes, and he sleeps with her, and he kills her husband. Was God okay with that? No. He has very harsh words to say to David afterwards. But God is a gentleman. He wasn't going to force David to do what he wanted him to do. It's why throughout the history of Israel, they constantly wandered away from God and came back and wandered away and came back and wandered away and came back. Why didn't God just force them? Just, you have to serve me. You have no choice. It's because he's a gentleman. He will never force himself on you. He might know what the right direction is that you need to go. He might know that the decision you're making is the wrong one and it's going to hurt you. He might try to warn you beforehand, but he leaves those things in your hands. God has entrusted himself to our obedience and he is waiting. He is willing. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you, but he will not force himself on you. So the question, the challenge that all of us need to consider as we start this year is will we let God in? Will you start this year by asking God, what's next? Lord, what's next? What do you have next? What are you calling me to do in 2024? What do you want me to work on in 2024? What's next to God? You know, as a church, this is one of the big things that we try to practice day in and day out. You know, our core values as a church are that we are welcoming, we are empowering, and we are spirit-led. And it is that third one that it kind of encompasses this message. That in everything we do, we want God's guidance. See, I don't want to stand on this stage and preach messages at you. 
that's great, but if God's not on it, there's no point. Might as well stay home and watch football. Or something else. I don't know. I heard someone scoff. <laughs> I might have the title of lead pastor and I might preach a lot, but this is God's church. And if there's ever a Sunday where he's like, I'm taking over, you're not preaching today? I'm like, absolutely, this is your church. God has free reign in this church to do what he wants to do, even if it makes us uncomfortable. But this is why, as a church, one of the things we have started to do a couple years back when I first became the lead is we started to take time every year to seek God and ask him, where are you leading us? God, what is next? What do you have for us in this next year? In 2022, this is when it started. We gathered our staff together and, and we prayed and we sought God and, and God spoke to us and he revealed to us that in 2022, what he was calling his church to was to go deeper. That was our word for the year. How many people were actually here for 2022? Come on. He's calling us deeper. Which is this idea that, that God is calling us out of our shallow and comfortable Christian life to step into the deep where our feet don't touch the ground, where we no longer see the, the, the shore on the horizon, where we have no hope but to trust him. He's calling us deeper. So that was our focus for 2022. And then in 2023, we did the same thing. We gathered the staff and the elders separately. Our elders are our spiritual authority, our spiritual overseers of the church. And we gathered these two groups separately and we prayed and we asked God, what do you have for us in 2023? And through that process, God revealed that he was calling us to surrender. How many of you remember that word? Come on. I'm just curious, how many people your first time at Gateway was in 2023? A few? A few? Okay, yeah, I see a few hands. That's great. But it was this idea of surrender. That we would lay down our own desires. We would lay down our own wants. We would lay down our own plans. And we'd say, God, take all that I have. All that I am. All that I want. All that I have. It is yours, God. Whatever you ask of me, God, I will give it to you. I surrender it to you. That we would put Jesus first in our lives. And so once again, 2024 rolled around. And, and, and this time we decided to expand this. So last November, we invited everyone in the church to, to come out to a vision casting night. And the purpose of this night was to seek God's will for his church in the next year. We had about 30 people come out from staff and board and elders and volunteers and members and just, ran, just various people in the church who wanted to come out. And through that night, God began to give us words of where he is leading us in 2024. Was we sought God and we said, God, what is next? What do you have next in 2024? What God revealed is that he is calling us as a church to be the kingdom of God. Now this word is packed with nuance and packed with meaning. Some of you might have just heard it and been like, okay, cool, what does that mean? Don't worry. I think I have until May figured out for messages just on kingdom. And then I already know what the series after that just, that brings us to the summer is all on kingdom. But this idea is that we as a church would become the kingdom of God. You know, God, Jesus never tried to institute the church. In Matthew 18, it's one of the two times, or Matthew 16, it's one of the two times Jesus references the church. He tells Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Matthew 18, he says, bring it to the church. This is in context of unforgiveness. But Jesus' message was never, I'm going to institute a religious institution that will suddenly plant places and buildings in, in, in cities and do nothing else. Jesus' main message was always, the kingdom of God is at hand. And where the kingdom of God is, things change. 
So this year as a church, this is our focus. What is God's kingdom doing? How can I be a part of God's kingdom that we would recognize God's authority and rule over all of creation? You might not see the fullness of it yet, but Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That we would recognize God's plan throughout all of history of establishing his kingdom through people. And we would recognize our role as kingdom bearers. So you see, when the kingdom of God steps into a situation, things change. When the kingdom of God steps into politics, corruption ceases. When the kingdom of God steps into a neighborhood, crime drops. When the kingdom of God steps into a family, love is promoted. When the kingdom of God steps into a city, homelessness ends, drug addiction ends, suicides drop, things change because the kingdom of God is a supernatural kingdom. You know, so often in the church, we get stuck in this perspective of the world is getting worse. It's like the world's going to hell in a handbasket, as my grandmother would say. If any of you know Southern expressions, you probably relate to that. And we get this perspective of, let's just escape to heaven and let God destroy the world. But in Matthew 28, this is what we call the Great Commission. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not some, all. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Know what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, go therefore and make Christians of all people. Disciples of nations. I don't even know what that looks like yet. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, throughout all of history, and we'll dig into this more next week, I promise. Throughout all of history, God's plan has been to institute and build his kingdom through his people. With the end goal of Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. Where there's no more sin or sickness or death. God's kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. That's why in Matthew, Jesus always preached, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand after he healed the sick. God's kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. That's what Hebrews 13 tells us. Though the world may shake, though the things that have been created may fall away, God's kingdom will never be shaken. God's kingdom holds authority over all of creation. That's why Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority belongs to me. God's kingdom, 1 John 3, has, says, has, has defeated the powers of the enemy. This is why the Son of Man was revealed, it says. God's kingdom, according to Jesus in Matthew 13, it is like yeast being worked into a batch of dough. Though it starts small, it grows and it expands until it fills the whole batch. So this is our focus. And I promise we'll dig into this more next week and over the coming weeks because there's a lot to unpack. But this is our focus this year. So I'm going to warn you, if you don't want to be challenged to step out of your comfort zone, you might want to find a different church. We'd love to have you stay here, but I'm just warning you. Because each of us has a role in the kingdom of God and God wants to use you and work through you and love on you to spread his power and his love into the world, into your family, into your business. And the question is, will you invite him in? But as we wrap up this message this morning, the question, the challenge that I have for each of us is to ask God, God, for 2024, what is it that you have next for me? What are you calling me to do? So as we close, we're just going to take a few minutes 
to spend time and ask God. Some questions on the screen, we'll work through them in a moment, but, but essentially we as a church, we believe that since God wants to teach us and God wants to lead us and God calls himself our father, that means God must speak to us. Because how can you teach and how can you lead and how can you father without having a relationship? And I believe that God has given us this opportunity to, to hear his voice. That you don't have to wait for a pastor to stand on stage or a prophet to declare over your life to hear God's voice. But God will speak to you here and now. Sometimes God speaks in audible, visible ways. You can hear his voice or you can see his face. Sometimes he speaks to us in our thoughts, in our sanctified imagination, through images in our head. Sometimes he'll speak to us through his word because this is a revelation of our God. Sometimes he'll speak through other people, sometimes through feelings. There's a lot of ways God can speak. But the key is that God's voice will always be loving. It will always glorify Jesus and it will always be in line with scripture because God is consistent and he will not change. And so as we start this year, this first Sunday of this year, I just want us to take a few moments and ask God, what do you have for me in 2024? What are you calling me to focus on? What do you want to teach me and where do you want to lead me? And we're just going to, I'm going to give about 45 seconds or a minute to just sit and let God speak to you and ask God that question. What do you have for me in this year? now just in that place of receiving from God, I encourage you to ask this follow-up and ask him, how can I make what he's told you, how can I make that a focus in 2024? How, what can I do, God, to grow in this area? And we'll just take a few seconds as well to listen to his voice. encourage you, whatever God is saying to you, be intentional to go after it. If you're like, that wasn't enough time, I, I, I didn't hear anything, take some time later and, and work through this. But whatever God is calling you to in 2024, do it. And if you don't know where to start, well, one of the things you're doing this year is, is part of this the word for the year on kingdom is we're going to be starting or we're going to start giving these monthly challenges. We're calling kingdom challenges. You can throw up the next slide. Essentially the idea of this is, is that as a church, we are going to be seeking God in these ways and we're going to challenge one another to do one or all of these challenges. We'll have new challenges every month. Just ways to get more intentional and focused on God and on his kingdom. So in January, I'll 
duck around as people are taking pictures. Don't worry. We'll, I believe we're going to send out this out in an email. It'll be on our social and online. And there'll be ways to find it online. But what I want to challenge all of us to do is this month to pick one of these or all of them. First one is to read the book of Matthew in one sitting. The point is not like over the course of the month. The point is take an hour, read the whole thing. If you want to go back and digest, do it. But reading a whole book of scripture is just a way, great way of seeing the whole scope of the narrative. Seeing everything the author is saying. It's easy to miss what the author is trying to say when you just start in the middle or stop and start always and then try to directly apply it to your life. It's important. It's valuable to see the whole scope. Matthew is a great book about the kingdom of God. Second challenge is to memorize Matthew 5, 1 to 16, whatever translation you like. This is the start of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It starts with the Beatitudes, like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And the beauty of the Beatitudes is it starts with kingdom and it ends with kingdom, which in the Greek indicates that everything in between is about the kingdom. The Beatitudes are attitudes that kingdom-minded people have. And then the last challenge is to start a 24-hour, 48-hour, 72-hour, seven-day fast from whatever you choose. It could be food, could be certain types of food, could be coffee, could be video games, could be social media, whatever. But the point of a fast is you take the time you would have devoted to the thing and you instead devote it to God. Fast is less about the physical act of removing things. It's more about the attitude of approaching God. It's coming to God and saying, what's next? But I just want to challenge you. As we seek God and we seek to do his will and we seek to what he has next for us in this year, I just want to challenge you to do this, to see what God will do in your life as you pursue him more. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you are our father. I thank you that even if we've had bad dads, bad human dads, or if we have dads who are distant or gone, dads who we've lost, that you are still our father. That we still have this opportunity to, to hear from you, to be led by you, to be taught by you, God. That you will never leave us as orphans. You will never abandon us or forsake us because your love for us is just so great. God, I thank you that you are such a loving father that as it says in Luke, you would leave the 99 to pursue the one. That your love for us is so expansive that you pursue us, but you still give us choice. And so Lord, we just posture ourselves in this place of receiving from you, of seeking you, of putting you first in our lives. Jesus, we just invite you in. Have your way in us. Have your way in us, oh God. Help us to pursue you, to hear your voice, to be led by you. That we will be a people that in 2024 won't be defined by our deficiencies, but will be defined by our supplier that we will be active members and participants in building your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Pray this in your holy, holy name. Amen.